But let's start with a story, the story of the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983. And I'm going to play you a little bit of um, footage from uh, the from a documentary about the um, this litigation. For flows through a remote wilderness in the southwest corner of Tasmania. For thousands of years, it had remained untouched. In the early 1980s, the Franklin became known to millions of Australians. The Tasmanian government had plans to dam the river. It was to be part of a massive hydroelectric scheme. But in 1983, these plans came to an abrupt halt. The High Court of Australia stopped the project after the biggest environmental battle Australians had ever seen. The fight for the Franklin would be a turning point for Australia's conservation movement. Preserving the environment became a national cause. The fight over the Franklin River was between two groups with very different opinions, the conservation movement and the Tasmanian government. While the government planned to dam the river for a hydroelectric scheme, the conservationists wanted the Franklin to remain undeveloped, and both sides strongly believed they were right. Let's take a closer look at the two groups. What caused their dramatic confrontation on the river, and how had this conflict of values come about? On one side was the Tasmanian government and its hydroelectric commission. The hydro, as Tasmanians called it, was responsible for building dams and power stations for the government. As the state's largest employer, it was an important organisation. For almost a century, the hydro helped Tasmania's economy to grow. The dams and power stations the hydro built enabled the government to provide industries with cheap electricity. The huge amounts of power these industries consumed provided the Tasmanian economy with a healthy income. To the Tasmanian government, the development of hydroelectric schemes meant progress. The hydro was a powerful and influential organisation. By 1970, there were already 40 dams dotted across the state. The Hydro had built dams on every major river in Tasmania, except the Franklin. And now, it wanted one there too. But it wasn't just the government and the Hydro who wanted another power station. Many Tasmanians also supported the plan. More dams meant more jobs in a state which suffered the highest rate of unemployment in Australia. Jobs weren't the only argument for another hydroelectric scheme. The hydro predicted that if a dam wasn't built, Tasmanians would face a severe power shortage in the next 10 years. We're providing for 10 years ahead, and uh, surely it's not the right thing to do to condemn people to having to live in a uh, depressed uh, manner with their energy supplies through failing to build what looks to be necessary 10 years ahead now. Pitted against the economic will of the Tasmanian government and the hydro was a small group of conservationists. Members of the Tasmanian Wilderness Society were concerned about the hydro scheme and its destructive effect on the environment. They argued that if the plan for a dam went ahead, the Franklin River and the ancient forests around it would disappear under a flood of water. 
Okay, I'm going to fast forward and we won't to what happened uh, because there was a political uh, step. Yep. Jump over the down. Walking through the streets of Melbourne. It was the biggest environmental rally in the country's history. Not since the Vietnam War protests of the 1960s had Melbourne seen such a dramatic expression of public opinion. In January 1983, less than a month after the blockade on the river had begun, a federal election was suddenly announced. How would this affect the conflict over the dam? Well, there has been... The headquarters for the political battle is the society's office in Melbourne. The main aim is simply to tip out of office government members in 13 key mainland marginal seats. That, in effect, means votes for Labor. Stopping the dam became one of the Labor Party's main election promises. Its leader, Bob Hawke, campaigned for votes at rallies organised by the Wilderness Society. I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Bob Hawke, who, with your help, will be the next Prime Minister of Australia. It's great to be here on the platform uh, with such people as uh, Bob Brown, who I regard as one of the great Australians. If we meet the requirements in regard to power and jobs, then there remains no reason at all for a dam that no one wants as a dam. I want to say unequivocally because Apparently, there has been some attempt to suggest that our position is not clear. I say to you that when Labor comes into government after the 5th of March, the dam will not proceed. The Labor Party went on to win the 1983 election. Bob Hawke was the new Prime Minister. But the majority of Tasmanians hadn't voted for his party. Work on the dam continued as if nothing had happened. The Tasmanian government and the hydro simply refused to give in. The future of the dam on the Franklin is in doubt. This film was shot three days after Mr Hawke's announcement that the dam would not be built. And down below, the work is clearly going ahead as if nothing's changed in Canberra. Remember that before the federal election, the Labor Party promised to stop the Tasmanian dam. So how did it go about fulfilling that promise once it was elected? Well, what the Federal Labor Government did was to pass a new law. It was called the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act. Under this law, the Federal Government had complete control over all World Heritage areas in the country. But determined to fight on, the Tasmanian Government challenged the new law. And that raised the question of who had the power over southwest Tasmania. The federal government or the state government? This was a constitutional question that had to be decided in court. The High Court in Brisbane has ruled that the Gordon Below Franklin Dam cannot be built. In July 1983, the High Court of Australia made its decision. The power over the Franklin rested with the federal government. Okay, we'll pause it there. And that nice historic footage. Doesn't everyone um, in that look really like you probably know Bob Brown? And he looks very old now. He looks much younger in that when he was a young whippersnapper. And Bob Hawke too. Okay, so that's a background to this important court case. Um, this is a picture that was iconic um, during that campaign. It's called Rock Island Bend. It was a picture by Peter Dom Dombromsky, uh, and it was used on a poster uh, by the Wilderness Society in the campaign to stop the Franklin, and it's a, arguably the most famous um, picture in Australian environmental history. So it's taken on the Franklin River. So just to um, locate where we're um, looking at. So Tasmania, as you know, big island down the um, south of, of Australia, um, got beautiful walking in the southwest of um, Tasmania, um, best walking, I think, in, uh, in Australia. 
um, if you're a keen bushwalker. Okay, so the location of the dam was proposed on the west coast. So if we focus in on that, there had been, as you saw in the film clip of the documentary, there'd been a number of dams built um, by the Tasmanian Hydroelectric Commission prior to the um, proposed Gordon Below Franklin. The biggest of those was the um, uh, Gordon River Dam, which had dammed um, the Gordon River uh, and created Lake Gordon and Lake Pedder. Lake Pedder, and this was built in the um, late 19. Um, 60s, early 1970s, and it led to the flooding of this beautiful um, Lake Pedder, which uh, is often regarded as the um, foundation for the modern Australian environmental movement because environmentalists were so horrified by the destruction of this beautiful area that it really galvanised them so that when the um, new dam was proposed in the early 1980s, there was already this festering um, discontent with the situation where these beautiful places could be destroyed and that really primed the community for the massive fight over the proposed dam. So this um, new proposed dam was downstream of the um, Gordon... So the um, Gordon River Dam was basically a little bit off this image and the Gordon River flows in from the south the Franklin River flows in from the north and they join uh, and the dam was proposed just beneath the junction. So the dam is often called the Gordon Below Franklin Dam um, or it's often simply called the Franklin Dam on the Franklin River. Um, and the rivers then flow out to the west coast of um, Tasmania. So that's where the dam was proposed, just there. So um, this is a map. Uh, I, a few years ago I approached the High Court for some of the evidence that was used in the court case. And so this was a map that was presented by the Commonwealth uh, in the court case to show um, where the... So here's the location of the dam and here's the Franklin River flowing south. Rock Island Bend, that famous picture, is actually way upstream from where the dam was proposed but it would have been flooded by basically the um, dam reservoir. This is an image um, which the research assistant who I had go into the um, High Court registry and get these um, pictures for me. You can see the wine glasses um, around it. So you get an idea how big it is. Um, just think that this um, was used as evidence in this court case back in 1983. So back in 1983, so pre-internet, pre-ready you know, ready use of satellite imagery and the like, you know, Google Earth, was you know, not even a glimmer in someone's mind at that point. Um, uh, getting good imagery was actually hard back in 1983. So what the Commonwealth did was get, um, when Bob Hawke was elected, they got an um, Australian Air Force uh, F-111 to fly down and take pictures. So they had an aero reconnaissance from um, a federal a Commonwealth jet basically of state government activity. Um, and they took these pictures and you can see it must have been massive in its day, like, it, well, it's still big, you know, it's basically a metre across, this big image of showing um, basically where the dam was being built. You can see the road going in. Um, I happened to find that image um, on a website and it's um, uh, it, at the Australian National University where I teach a course. Um, on environmental litigation, it hangs um, in the staff um, common room and it was, it's been framed with pictures of all of the members of the High Court that decided the case's signature on it uh, and it, the caption to the picture explains the story. Um, in the Franklin Dam case, um, sorry, the Franklin Dam case is one of the most momentous decisions of the High Court in the history of the Australian constitutional law. By a majority of four to three, the High Court held that basically the Commonwealth could protect the river. Um, it was preceded by a tumultuous period of protest demonstrations and civil disobedience. In a celebrated incident dubbed by the media as a spy flight, this photograph was taken in early 1983 from a Royal Australian Air Force F-111 under instruction from Attorney, Ger Attorney General Gareth Evans, who in turn was dubbed irrelevant, irrelevantly by the media as the fictitious um, Cavalier Air Ace Biggles um, and was tendered in evidence by the Commonwealth. The signatures on the photograph are of the seven High Court judges 
uh, and were obtained by um, a member of an, uh, a graduate of ANU who was an um, associate to them at the time. Um, the High Court Registry also gave us some of the pictures, other pictures that have been taken. This one is showing a work area, which you saw in that little bit of footage as well, a road going in, um, so the construction for the dam, more of the road, uh, and this is a point where basically some of the loading was going on. Um, this isn't taken from the RF. I just got this off Google Earth, just showing the junction between the um, Franklin River coming in there from the right and the Gordon River and where they flow around. So this is a sort of area that would have been flooded. Uh, and this is um, just a random picture taken from Google Earth um, from that area, uh, just because it's, I just threw it in because it's such a gorgeous picture. Um, and I love walking in these sorts of areas. It's sort of all covered in moss and you sort of look around and you think if, like, if, um, if there's any fairies, they live in these places. Um, just to contrast it, this is the Gordon River Dam that was built in 1969 to 1974. So massive high dam and massive um, area that was flooded behind it. Here's just a couple of pictures of protesters. 1982, there's a massive um, blockade of protesters came from all around Australia, uh, went down to um, Tasmania, and this is a protest um, in Hobart in 1981, so a couple of years before the election. So it was building for years before um, the election. So um, Bob Hawke was elected, passed some laws saying basically the um, you couldn't um, damage uh, anything or do anything within a World Heritage Area uh, without the Commonwealth's approval, and they weren't going to give approval for this dam. The state government, the Tasmanian government, challenged that and said that the law was unconstitutional, that the Commonwealth didn't have the power to make that law. It went immediately to the High Court because it was this massive constitutional case, and like normally it takes years for a case to get to the High Court. This case, I think, started in March of 1983 and was decided in July of 1983 and it actually takes up about 300 pages of judgment. It's an entire volume of the Commonwealth Law Reports. Um, so they basically heard it and decided it within three months. And the key issues involved the Commonwealth Constitution. So if we rewind back to um, Federation for Australia in 1901, Prior to Federation, Australia was made up of a series of um, colonies um, from the United Kingdom, um, and um, each of those colonies, New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and the like, decided to come together and form um, a single nation, which would still have the um, Queen of England as the Queen of Australia. Uh, I think it might have been the King at that time, but it would have been the King at that time, but anyway. Um, the monarch in England is still the monarch of Australia, and when they formed um, together, so they, instead of being individual colonies, they formed a nation and they created a national government to govern them all. Something like the Lord of the Rings with you know, <laughs> one ring to rule them all or something. Anyway, the one ring to rule them all was the Commonwealth Constitution. So this was created and what it did was create the federal government and it also gave the federal government certain powers because the state governments didn't want to give up all of their power. The real drivers for forming <clears throat> Australia as a nation were two main things. One was defence, um, so the threat of invasion by you know, um, some other country and the, the need for a national defence, and also freedom of trade between the colonies. They were the two main drivers. Uh, but then a certain number of powers were given to the Commonwealth Government to make laws in respect of, and they're contained in Section 51 of the Constitution. The main ones that are relevant to environmental issues um, I've listed here. So we've got trade and commerce with other countries. So if someone wants to sell something outside Australia um, and or within the States, the Commonwealth can regulate it, and the Commonwealth used that power to restrict, for instance, um, sale of sand from, say, Fraser Island um, when they wanted to stop sand mining on Fraser Island in the 70s. So that sort of power can be used. Um, taxation. Um, the Commonwealth has power to make taxes, and they can be for any purpose. So like the carbon tax, when it was created by the Gillard government, it was, was a valid law of the Commonwealth, simply under the taxa taxation power. 
Um, quarantine, um, fisheries, um, foreign corporations, uh, 5120 is another important one. So if it's a foreign corporation or a trading or financial corporation, um, then the Commonwealth can make laws in respect of them. That's important because most things that damage the environment now are done by corporations, like individuals like you and me, we only have small scale impacts. Any big enterprise in our modern society is going to be a forming, formed as a corporation. So the Commonwealth can regulate them because they're corporations. But the big um, fight in the Tasmanian Dam case was about the um, 29th um, of the listed powers, external affairs. So the Constitution basically reads, the Commonwealth, um, the Commonwealth Parliament shall have power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to external affairs. So what does external affairs mean? Um, the, back in 1901 when the Constitution was formed, you know, issues about environment, climate change, all that sort of stuff obviously wasn't a concern or not as big a concern. Um, whatever was meant by external affairs, it had to be interpreted as just basically part of the text of the Constitution. And one of the key things that had, you know, obviously the world had moved on since 1901, one of the key things that the Commonwealth had been um, able to do, which it didn't have a power over in the 1930s, was make laws with respect to aviation because back in 1901, there weren't even any planes. When, when planes started to fly around, it made sense to have national laws about aviation rules and aviation safety because you don't really want to get to the border and have to fly like on the different side of planes coming towards you. Um, so there was a national framework for aviation laws uh, which relied upon an international treaty about, um, and so it made sense to have things linked to international agreements that the Commonwealth could make laws in respect of. So the Commonwealth had agreed to the World Heritage um, Convention when it was created in the early 1970s. So it had been around for a decade. And the argument that the Commonwealth put forward was that it could make laws under the external affairs power simply to fulfil its international legal obligations. Um, and it's a peculiar aspect of Australian, Australia's national laws that our Commonwealth government has this power linked to external affairs. It's different in other countries. If you're from China or the US, you have different constitutional arrangements. But this is a really significant part of um, our framework in Australia. And basically the um, High Court held that the Commonwealth um, had power. It, it was... Um, in the Tasmanian Dam case, that was the seminal case, but it was then there was a series of later cases that um, basically affirmed it and locked it in. So it's now just an accepted part of Australian constitutional law that the Commonwealth has power to enact legislation that is reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. Now, if you th think about that, have a look at um, on... I've given you a handout, which has got um, a summary of the EPBC Act on one page. But if you turn over, I've just given you a page out of my synopsis book, uh, and it summarises the main constitutional rules, including in that paragraph basically that test. Um, and it's, it's significant to understand those relationships between um, uh, levels of government in Australia if you're working in the system because it's often assumed by state governments in particular that um, they still take the view that the Commonwealth doesn't have a legitimate role in relation to protecting the environment. And constitutional um, writers talk about there's this big difference between the assumed constitution and the real constitution. The real constitution doesn't have, basically doesn't reserve to the states the power to regulate activities over the environment. The Commonwealth actually has massive powers to regulate those activities. In practice, it's mainly the states that still do it, but that's really a historic artefact. The Commonwealth could do a lot more if it wanted to, but basically since the big fight in the 1980s, the Commonwealth has pretty well retreated to doing 
not being too adventurous, not taking on the states too much, and leaving the states to basically manage most of the environmental issues with Commonwealth uh, acting as in an oversight role. So anyway, that handout gives you um, a summary of the main um, constitutional um, arrangements that arose out of um, that case. So that's the main rule. Um, a key thing to understand is because of the width of Australia's international legal ob obligations, this gives the Commonwealth a very wide power to make laws to protect the environment. And I give the example on the handout of um, Article 8 of the Biodiversity Convention. So Australia is a party to the Biodiversity Convention and it basically requires us, uh, requires Australia to conserve biodiversity both within and outside of protected areas. And so if you look at something like D, Article 8D, Australia has an obligation to promote the protection of ecosystems, natural habitats and the maintenance of viable populations of species in natural surroundings. That's the international obligation. A Commonwealth law will be valid if it's reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil that obligation. So it's a very wide obligation. It's a very, well, I wouldn't say very, it's a, quite a lenient test for the linkage between them that's required. So the Commonwealth has very broad powers. Um, it generally doesn't use them. Uh, it generally leaves things to the states. A key other thing to understand and the final key constitutional thing to understand is um, under section 109 of the Australian Constitution, if there's a valid law of the Commonwealth, it overrides state laws to the extent of inconsistency. So that was why in the Tasmanian Dam case, the state government wanted to build it, the Commonwealth government didn't want it built, the Commonwealth government won because basically its laws in our system can override state laws. So even though the state had passed laws saying this dam can be built, they were inconsistent with the Commonwealth laws which prevented it. Don't get too hung up on inconsistency. In practice, it's very rarely um, the case that you'll find inconsistent laws. Normally, um, most laws operate side by side and you need approvals under both. So if you're acting for someone and they want to build a hotel or some big resort somewhere, you basically have to get approval at a state level and you have to get approval at a Commonwealth level for it. And um, if you don't get approval at both of those levels and including the local government in the state level, if you don't get approval from both of those, then you can't proceed with the project. It's basically you'll be committing an offence against one of those, you know, either state or Commonwealth laws. So you need all relevant approvals is the basic thing um, that you need to understand for operating in the system. Um, as I said, section 109 creates this hierarchy of Commonwealth laws overriding state, but don't get hung up on that because it's very rarely the case in practice. Normally they operate side by side. 